my name is James, um, as Andrew has said, I am an architect and I run a design studio in London with two other co-founders. We're called Project Ethics. Um, we work under the ethos of fantastic pragmatism. And that means that we use a narrative approach to our projects. So this is a shop window display for Uniqlo that featured a series of London pigeons weaving their nests from the season's collection. We're playful. This is a beach hut in Eastbourne shaped like a power station that on a bad weather day can generate just enough power to make a cup of tea. <laughs> We're critical. Uh, this proposal for a piece of public art in South London um, proposed to build the amount of house that a whole year's average salary from that borough could afford, 3.93 square metres. We're also pragmatic and logical, so this scheme we're currently working on is a new building that stitches together a series of disparate historical buildings, including a fog factory and a chapel, into new offices, showrooms and workshops for a furniture company in Yorkshire. So I went to school here, and when I was a student at Frensham, my English teacher, Jeremy Bourne, used to play a game of consequences with us. So for those of you who don't know it, consequences is an old parlour game where a group of people co-author a story in response to a series of questions. So you give a, a phrase or, or a single word answer, and the results are often sort of quite absurd. Um, and we wanted to play an architectural version of Consequences. Um, we wanted to do this kind of as a, as a critique of the methods used in public consultation. Um, so particularly on consultation for large housing developments and regeneration. So our architectural Consequences game um, asked these questions and it, it enabled a, a group of people to kind of co-author their dream building without being affected by outside sources. So we turned that into a pavilion and a series of architectural models in, a, in, a, um, in an exhibition. And here, the tenants of Oxo Tower Wharf want to build a temple, which is monumental, but the management landlord wants to build beach huts, which are crammed with chickens. So you can see the, the sorts of responses that, that we got. So this was a critique of user engagement, but user engagement is central to the work that we do in design for mental health. And for us, that began with a project called Mad Love. And that's an artist-led project where we're part of a, a larger team that work on that, that works with mental health service users, parents, carers, and professionals to imagine the ideal spaces for good mental health. And the first sort of manifestation of that project was this installation at FACT in Liverpool, um, where we, we sort of spatialised some of those ideas, those co-created ideas, such as this Turkish delight shaped conversation booth for small intimate conversations. The stripy form in the distance is the cooling tower, which is a kind of playful spin on, on the paddock cell. There's an event space in the middle, and importantly, there's always opportunities to retreat from the action, such as via this bookcase staircase. And you can even change the weather, which is projected onto a series of umbrellas that hang in the canopy above the installation. So, on the sort of back of the work that we were doing in the arts context, looking at design for mental health, we won the competition to design a child and adolescent mental health service unit, the interiors of the new Royal Hospital for Children and Young People in Edinburgh. And sort of building on what we'd learned with the Mad Love workshops, we, we developed a series of engagement workshops, again working with both inpatients and outpatients, staff, NHS staff, and their parents and carers. And these are just some of the responses that, that we gained from those workshops. One of the kind of common responses to the question of what does good mental health feel like was that of the coast. So, so we used this, and this came up in almost every workshop that we ran, 
Um, so we use that, that kind of coastal theme as a, as a narrative thread to kind of give coherence to our designs for the interiors of the department. We developed what we call a kit of parts approach. So that's a kind of menu of components that um, the NHS staff were able to sort of choose from uh, in order to kind of make best use of the, the budget, which is of course very limited. It's NHS, it's also charity funded, so these are sort of some of the, the things that we propose. Uh, here we see the interior of the inpatient sort of open communal space. So the coastal theme is picked up by a lighthouse in the distance. There are always also kind of places to, to retreat in the looks in the wall and alcoves. And the design of the new hospital building meant that this space was sort of landlocked. It didn't have a lot of natural light. So we created uh, a vaulted ceiling with artificial skylights to kind of give the space a bright, airy feel. The coastal theme is picked up in a uh, material and colour palette that is deliberately non-institutional, but importantly also doesn't try to evoke an artificial sense of homeliness. We really feel that doesn't fool anyone. Bedrooms were not originally part of our scope, but um, they were very important all the same. There's a quote here from a parent of a teenage girl who was no patient in the space, and she revealed to us that when she visited her daughter, mostly on a daily basis, herself, her husband and her other children didn't even have anywhere to sit, which forced them to all sit on her daughter's bed. Fortunately, we were able to secure more charity funding, so that has enabled us to expand our design to include bedroom spaces. Um, so we've got built-in televisions, personalizable wall boards to allow the occupants to give their own personality on their space, and very importantly, we have this pull-out window seat to enable natural conversations to be held in these rooms. So, working on projects for clients like the NHS, um, we, we need to sort of remind ourselves to think of the bigger picture um, and think more speculatively and cre creatively. So, a couple of years ago, Mad Love was again commissioned, this time by the Welcome Collection, as part of their Bedlam exhibition. And for this, we proposed this landscape-type architectural model. It's a very large model, it's two metres long. Um, and this was conceived as a spatial manifesto of good mental health spaces. The centre of the model is where all the active spaces happen, such as this bakery, which again, as before, always has these opportunities to retreat and be periphery from the action. As you move up the hillside, privacy gradually increases, and bedrooms were imagined as a series of tree houses, each giving their occupants an individual identity. Activity is uh, sort of communicated through the form of these sort of brass objects and pieces of furniture, uh, and they sort of suggest the sort of different things that take place, such as this fishing boat on the lake. I really like making big models because I think that they communicate really effectively with a very broad audience. Uh, this exhibition was commissioned by the Design Museum and was the culmination of my residency there in 2014. Um, this time it was looking at housing and it proposed to enliven existing housing estates by using ideas from often overlooked <coughs> condemned housing typologies of the past. My research material concentrated on two housing types that don't exist in London anymore and for good reason. The first was the rookery, which was a network of self-organising slums that threaded their way through the city until the 19th century. The second was London Bridge, which, as you may know, was once an inhabited structure, uh, which had this kind of lively bridge deck of kind of commercial activity and then houses dwellings above. I used drawing as a way of giving form to my ideas, and here, in some of my sketches, you see how I begin to overlay those historic ideas, the, the positive things that I found in those housing types, 
uh, overlay that onto the structures of an existing housing estate in London. London Bridge has become uh, a mechanism of enhancing, of using rooftop spaces. So it uses the roofs of mid-rise housing blocks and there is a layer of commerce and activity, this time in the form of studios and workspaces. And then the houses contain a series of kind of small starter dwellings above. The rookery has become a series of courtyards and laneways that take the place of unused parking garages on the ground plane. Each courtyard is a self-organised housing cooperative built by self-builders. So those ideas of kind of sociability and social spaces in, in that project, we, we use those to inform our lats work. And, and lately we've been doing a lot of work working with technology startup companies uh, to uh, design how they work and, and create their workspaces. This project is for a client who makes software for the hospitality industry. And the space is designed around this one communal table where every member of the team eats together every day. However, during the design phase, the client um, did a sort of series of experiments where he created different seating types in his existing office. And he found that actually when he created the banquet table of his dreams, the conversation died. So in response to this, we created a, a table with many corners that, that facets in order to kind of give these more intimate spaces and ensure that conversation thrives, but that everybody feels that they are part of a collective whole. Recently, this summer, we were lucky to be shortlisted to design the Dulwich Pavilion at Dulwich Picture Gallery. We were one of uh, six architecture studios to be shortlisted. Our proposal references the gallery's mausoleum space, which is this beautiful, eerie, yellow space, and creates this canopy of coloured light that sails over an exhibition, uh, an exhibition and entertainment space at the front of the gallery. For those of you who don't know Dulwich Picture Gallery, it's a historically important building, it's designed by Sir John Soane, but it has this rather opaque and standoffish facade. So for us, instead of creating the usual pavilion in, in the grounds, we decided to use the series of interior spaces, these arch spaces, and connect that gallery building out into its context, so that it has a physical engagement with the world around it, and gives an open facade. The materiality that created this kind of series of, of colour was from uh, industrial BBC clean room curtains. So these create these really rich different hues of light. And they're also soft and tactile to touch, so it was open to children to physically engage and play with the structure. This project has been sort of extremely exciting for us because it, it's marked a kind of a next stage in the work that we do and has sort of opened us to the design of um, spaces for entertainment uh, and experiential spaces. And we hope that this will now inform the work that we do next in design for cultural spaces, that of entertainment, but also for education. I hope that the work that I've shared with you today gives you sort of some of a sense of, of what we're passionate about and what we're, we're interested in, um, and also what we really care about and what drives us to, to make our work. Um, thank you very much.